by the nine and four. I welcome you to this, the tale thus far. Wrapping up a season storyline in one compilation. I do hope you enjoy by the caravans of the halflings and gnomes were essential for many of the hamlets and villages scattered across the plains and woods of this continent. However, the people of Jamamara as a whole were very unlikely to be too hampered by something as minor as weeks of harsh storms. My people had gotten that part of our duty to them right at least. Walking on the surface of the pristine powder, I could feel the land beneath the half dozen feet of snow, slowly thrumming with the slowly building energies that would burst forth in the spring in grasses and flowers. Looking up, I saw the answer to my musings, as a low flying convoy of sky ships, alight with the telltale sounds of gnomish music and halfling shanties, drifted by. If you can't go through, go over. I smiled. The younger racers were never kept down for long. They always find a way, don't they? I turned to look, and sitting on top of a signpost, swinging his bare legs and staring up at a skyship, was a small elven child, wearing a set of deep purple robes. He turned to me. How you doing, Lord Alon? Formal. This couldn't be a good sign. This child was many things, but Forma was rarely one of them. I cast my senses around in a few hundred yards in all directions, just in case his partner in crime was about to execute one of their legendary and masterful pranks. She's not where this meeting, Lord Alon. You are being called. For the briefest of moments in my shock, I sank nearly an inch into the snow. The universe calls for me? I returned myself back to the snowy surface. He did the worst thing he could possibly have done then. He laughed. <laughs> no, Lord Alon, the universe does not call for you, Analar. The revered do. And with a flash of a wicked smile, his eyes ebbed, brightened, and the world around me shifted. Hours later, the world shifted again, and I was again staring at the child, whose eyes were still dimming. Interesting. Whatever they wanted with you, it must be important. Especially if they sent you back to when you left. He left the question hanging. The revered are considerate of the time of others. If he didn't know, I really wasn't at liberty to fulfill his curiosity. Just then, the wind started to pick up coming from the mountains, causing the snow to start trailing off the tops of the drift in long lines. A lone, long crack of thunder resounded. He looked past me to the unseen mountains. Another bad storm coming. He hopped up, with his feet balanced on the road sign, tapping with one. Why woods only a hundred miles off? It'd be best if you were there before the storm catches you. With a tailwind, you could easily make it, even if you don't cheat. Childish teasing was very clear in his voice. May I remind you, young man, I am a firstborn transcendent Analar, wielder of the flame and a master of the true fist. Why would I need to outrun a storm? I realized I was staring down at him. I had expanded back to my full fifteen foot height, towering over the little one. He only looked up at me and smiled fading away, with only five words left hanging in the air. Because I told you to. With that, like a balloon pierced, I deflated back down to my preferred seven and a half foot height. Now alone, I went to cast my senses onto the coming storm, and as the wind continued to pick up, I stopped. 
His advice really was what it appeared. And I would bet an Ani his advice had nothing to do with the dangers of the coming storm, whatever they may be. So, I spread my wings and let the rising wind take me into the air. At this speed, I figured I'd beat the storm there by at least two hours. I hoped Wyward's Tavern had its signature roast tonight. Now, it was something I was looking forward to. I had work to do. I landed 20 feet outside the outer ring of monuments. They had always confused me, but I never dared to risk whatever kept this simple little piece of paradise safe by flying or gracing myself within the rings. As I had done for nearly a decade, many centuries ago, I cast my senses to the monuments, to within them, to around them, to through them, and once more tried to solve the riddle of this place. However, as each and every time I had tried before, there was nothing strange or unusual about the metal that made the monuments. No distortions of temperature or energy, of mass or shape to hint at the monument being anything but a metal thing. Kang, what in the gun are you doing here? I spun, snapped out of the intense focus I had been in. I had not heard anyone approach, but seeing the large drag wall supremus with his metal bionic arm, the answer for that was clear. Dressed in a set of simple robes, he looked me in the eye and smiled. Lefty was a humble man, a respected member of the hunters, and a servant to the greater realms for years uncounted. He was also one of the celestial touched, and as such, had many abilities that defied common logic, such as being able to move from one place or another nearby without motion, magic, grace, or the like. He was a friend to all, and a trainer of heroes and gods. Well, mentioning that last part was a sure way to get him annoyed. Lefty, I was just on a walk from Avlin. Hell of a winter so far. Looks like another storm incoming. Come on, let's get to the tavern. I can smell roast. Smiling, he joined me and we walked into town. We talked of current times and old adventures as I had had the honor of working with him more than once before. We reached the tavern, with the storm just beginning to drop its heavy snows. We settled down with large plates of hot roast and tankards of warm, fine drinks, all the better to shake the chill from our bones. As we spoke and ate, joke and drank, I found that he had knowledge of an item of interest to my latest endeavor a relic of pre-feather and scale providence. This item was something I was thinking to seek out far later on, as it was something very specific and very unlikely to be discoverable via the normal channels. We continued to talk late into the night about how one would reclaim such an artifact safely and intact, as it was currently part of a collection that was most stringently guarded and far outside the standard methods of retrieval. It was just before midnight before he and I had come up with a plan, a way to get the artifact back to where it belonged, all while taking care of several other considerations Lefty had about the situation as I had described it. Amazingly, this millennia-old being had an almost childish energy when it came to challenges like this. I'll have to make a house color too, and this should work. Only downside, time. He looked at me seriously. What is our timeline? Loose. If I am correct, we're still only in the prelude. He looked at me even more seriously, setting his jaw solid. How bad are we talking? Can't say. The look I got from him was scathing. No, 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 no. I am not keeping secrets on this. By the nine and four, I swear I am not. However, the true degree of the danger is not clear. Other than, it's enough to warrant us engaging in such actions. You best hope so, Tag. You are looking at playing with people that do not 
like to be played with, and some of them can kill even the likes of you, and they can make it stick. Your endless regeneration wouldn't slow them down a heartbeat. You know this. He lifted his tankard, smiling. Tapping mine to his, I replied, I'm aware, but what is worth us being involved in that doesn't come without such risks? As I crossed the portal into my ready room, I could feel the warmth of a fire burning within. As the portal closed behind me and the grip of where I had just been was washed away by the warmth of the fire as well as the magics of this entranceway as they cleaned away any grime, grum, or mess that had been caked on me from my week-long excursion. I crossed the room and laid my hand on a garment rack, speaking a word. With another flush of warm, smooth sensation flowing across me, I felt my armor and my gear removed and replaced by the simple trousers, shirt, and vest that were laying on the rack. Looking at my now stored armor and gear, I began to reflect on what I had just left behind. Things were never static within the realms, even when it was just Jamamar herself. Now, with the Age of Stars and the expansion it brings, trying to keep an eye on things was becoming more and more of an issue. And things were starting to slip through the cracks. I was pulled from these thoughts by a soft tone echoing in the room, a chime indicating a message on my Trebucom. As I turned to look at it, the small little device that would sling missives and small packages t across the realms, for a small fee of course, and saw the freshly delivered tube. Taking it, opening it, and reading the missive contained rather quickly, I set the tube on the table and went to leave as I had somewhere to be in not too long. The missive was slid into a pocket on my vest. As I approached the lecture hall a few minutes later, an elf flagged me down. Sir, Pa Thea will be concluding his speech in but a few moments. Here's the list for this month's testees. He handed me a tablet of metal and crystal, a Chris Tech info tome. Glancing at it, I see the names of the testees with a few glyphs next to each, a shorthand to encapsulate each of these applicants observed or already known traits. Thank you. Please inform the Master of Examinations that this shouldn't be a long one, no more than five or ten minutes at tops. I will head there directly. Thank you as always. With that, he smoothly moved past me and back into the facility. I made my way to the entrance of the hall, hearing the sound of a great many people starting to clap. Hearing the applause rise, then ebb, I waited for the speaker, Topaz three-star hunter, far there, to come through the door. As the dwarf did so, he greeted me with a smile. Lively bunch, but they're soft, he grumbled dismissively, as was his way. Aren't they always? That's the point of this. I smiled and passed him and made my way to the hall and onto the stage at its center. I took the crowd in for a moment as I let everyone settle down now that they were noticing someone was back at the podium. There were just over 500 of them. At once, too many, and yet not nearly enough. I could hear whispers attempting to divine who I was and what this was about. This was, of course, an uns scheduled lecture, they were not ready for another speaker to come forth. After another long moment, I began. Good morning. I will make this clear and I will make this simple. You are all here because you believe you are hunter material. Now each of you, do me a favor and take a look at the person to your fore, to your back, to your left, and to your right. As they did, Murmurs of confusion began to rise. Of the people you have just looked at, you or one of them will not survive. Furthermore, only one of the five of you is likely to even pass. One of you might be offered the platinum coin. The other two might survive, but will be unlikely to ever attempt to join again. 
typically because you will be too mentally scarred or physically maimed to do so. Confusion became a quiet tension. The hunters are who the realms turn to when they need heroes, large and small. We are those individuals that are granted great leeway by the sovereignties of the realms and are greatly respected by the populace. The claim of a hunter on property or discoveries is, by council law, nearly supreme. Our actions in commissioning of a contract in most cases are treated with total legal immunity. We are called to end threats that could very well warrant the involvement of the gods should we fail in our duties. To be a licensed hunter and not one of the coin is as much an ultimate duty to the realms as it is an ultimate freedom of them. The test you are about to undergo will see to which of you are ready for this duty. Make no mistake, I do not find the death of a dozen worthy applicants to prevent one unworthy one to be anything but a cheap cost. Do not think the tales of this test and its dangers have been anything but watered down. The room was quiet as I looked across it, all faces serious and slightly worried or fearful as it should be. As Father has instructed you, in the morning you will make your way to your assigned vessels. You will then have two weeks to further prepare and finalize any choices you need to. After those two weeks, there will be no chance to exit this test. Those of you that do choose to leave before that point, to better prepare or to focus on being a hunter of the coin, will be issued the platinum coin. There is no dishonor or judgment with this. I am aware that many of you are only here at this point to receive the platinum coin. There's no shame in it. Please be very well and have great fortunes in your future career. Without the hunters of the coin, the licensed hunters would not be able to be flexible or amenable to the needs of the realms. So thank you for your vital and very important service. For the rest of you, your ships will land on a staggered timetable. You will have one day to disembark, get your bearings, and begin. From that point on, until you leave the island, you are being tested. To pass this test, you must obtain nine recommendations from a possible thirteen. These are available across the island. One each from a hunter's official within each of the three main towns, with one at the landing point as well. There will be one local in each main town, a person of interest or of importance who is recognized by the guild to hand out recommendations. Furthermore, there are five individuals at large as well who will be able to issue a recommendation. You will need to learn the area, the politics of the locals, and how to navigate all of that to succeed. You have one year to complete this. Once you have your nine recommendations, you will report to the landing site. From then on, you will be a hunter. Are there any questions? A hand was held up, a manorie. I nodded in his direction and he began. Sorry, that's only twelve uh, Sir, apologies. Every instructor we've had this week has introduced themselves. Are we just supposed to know who you are? The pockets of laughter and chuckles were subtly offset by a few sharp intakes of air. A few of the assembled had an idea, it appeared. Good question and well said. The 13th recommendation can be obtained via a special task. Now, each of you should look under your chairs and notice there is a tube there. 
as each found the container, I continue. The thirteenth task is to find the bunny and feed the contents of that tube to it. The silence was deadly. My smile, why? As for who I am, my apologies for not introducing myself. I am Smoke. You may have heard of me. Faces blanched, air was gasped, and off to the side I heard a small thud, then smelt the unmistakable odor of fear expelled waste. I turned to see a small group of enlightened circled around one of their number who had fainted in fear, with several others trying their very best not to let panic and fear do the same to them. I smiled softly and just gave an affirmative nod. Only one? Your tough one's over there. Make sure to have them keep an eye on you. They visibly calmed, taking my words to heart. As they should, I meant them. They had just seen and realized their boogeyman, the reaper of their kin, was less than 50 feet away. I'd say only one of them passing out was a very good sign. A praetor was the one to ask the next question, seemingly unfazed by the scene. And this, this bunny, will be able to give out the recommendation? Is there another proof of this deed we are supposed to obtain? Many whispers were already beginning to hum about this being an easy score. Oh no, he'll be more than happy to give the recommendation. Just do not be mean or rude to him, or dear V's try to attack him. Silence again reigned. If we can keep the deaths by Bunny to less than ten of you this testing cycle, I would be very grateful. Confusion once again was thick in the air. But the Praetor, to his credit, just nodded. All that said, you are now aware of what is ahead. You have until morning to make your last acquisitions before the trip. Two weeks to choose to exit before the test begins after that. So, how do you really think they're going to fare? A familiar voice and tone, it's Lefty, fell into step with me as I made my way to the mess for a drink and a meal. Of the 500 of them, 50 will pass with the star. Another 150, normally, maybe 200. 100, 150, leave with the coin. The rest will die. He grimaced at that. Lefty was a good soul and hated that such death was required to maintain the quality of the hunters. You're not on for this testing cycle, Lefty. What brings you around? Need to bounce some things off of you. Been hearing some strange rumors around the colonies. I'll buy. I watched the drag wall lead through the portal, and then I allowed my face to drop the veneer of normality and impassivity it had been wearing for the last half hour. As that portal snapped shut, I stood and made my way to the console behind my desk and began to quickly search for answers to the various queries that my now departed visitor's unexpected intrusion had raised. A little under twenty minutes, several thousand records, and not a clue to be found later, I stepped away more concerned and bothered than I had been for quite a while. Something was amiss, and there were forces that spoke of great upheavals and changes, and I, Order Skychild alone, one of the divine of the realms, was all but ignorant to them until this unforeseen guest's arrival. I took a moment to consider whom I should speak to on this matter. The agent was on the move, and this could only be the prelude of something realm-shaping. With matters of such weight, it was vital to assess the full breadth of what I had been made aware of, as often there was as much to be gleaned by the who, where, when, and how of such interactions as to the what being spoken. He had come from the core realm Cognexi, from Fulgeria, Fort Falcon Flight in particular. I thought about the time schedules and smiled. 
that's where he would have gotten the sanction approved. Also where he would have been able to make the trip here without raising an eyebrow. The implications of that tidbit led to a few others that helped me in decide how to proceed. Unfortunately, this conclusion brought about another issue. When you are one of the divine, you learn that there are most definitely rules and edicts one can creatively interpret. Well, there are some others that are absolute in meaning and in punishment. Even as a god, a crafter of races, and hero of the realms, I still had a boss to answer to. And the Empress was not one to overlook violations of her edicts that could endanger the realm she is sworn to protect. Such as the edict prohibiting my going to the home realm. To be fair, I am a walking planet killer. Despite the myriad overlapping, interlocking, and redundant systems I have in place to negate the danger I represent by my very presence. While I might evade censure for many things, bringing even the faintest hint of danger to the home world would cause far too much in the way of distraction from what was going on to be worth the risk. So, the conundrum. This was not something I could discuss in any way but face to face, and trying to summon the man I needed to speak to wouldn't work either, as now that I was aware that things were in motion, I had to consider the chances that I, and others, were going to be observed. At least to the extent we could be. And with that thought I smiled. The answer was now clear in my mind, as I made my way to my personal armory. You know you can't go to the home realm. The Empress won't allow it. Besides, that is not where you need to go anyways. The man you seek is currently in chambers. I turned to see the child sitting on some very delicate equipment, smiling broadly under his robe's hood and swinging his legs merrily. Then a furrowing of his brow, as he no doubt tried to escape, having left his little cryptic hint, but found there was no way for him to do so. You can slip in through an open portal and then hide yourself from me. But once it's closed, there is no way out. Have you forgotten where you have snuck an into? This is my realm and duty, for I am the keeper of that which may stay hidden and kept. Indeed you are, Ordis. And while I still could escape, there is no point when I can just ask you to kindly allow me to go. A soft threat, but not a wholly hollow one. I know one day I'm going to have to make an exhibit of you. With that a flash of contempt, so unfitting a child's face. And it was gone again. But not today. I have real work to do. So off you go, little one. And with that, I opened the smallest gap in the protections that kept my home and duty safe. And the child faded away with a soft chuckle at my final barb. I left right on his heels and sealed things behind me, and set off to where I had just been so kindly directed. The city of the Celestial Touched, Fonts Court. Arriving, and then boarding a private transport, I set it to take a long, winding course on its way to the center of the city, with three passes of each quarter on the way in. Settling in as it took off, I looked out the window and took in the wonder of the city. Having started in the crisp quarter, with its shifting buildings, always being changed for new uses at their owner's whims, I smiled as I saw two buildings almost collide only to merge into a unified structure, new in its architecture entirely. Next, we crossed over the shadowy, dark streets of the Void Quarter, and I could see the rotating lights and the sudden shift of people's position between passes of that illumination. 
If I were not a god, I would not even remember that there were people down there after the light left them and they were once more in darkness. Even as it was, I could feel the memories trying to fade. The transport shifted to a higher altitude as we entered into the Temporsus Quarter, as the vast scatterings of buildings and landings suspended in the air set to accommodate their residents' ability to move in all directions without needing to make a transversal. Also, the flitter of fog-like energy around each of them, helping to maintain chronostability for both the city and these ever-time-shifting people. The Aether Quarter was surprisingly calm compared to the others, considering how the people were going from place to place were doing so by the very ground lifting and carrying them along cleanly and efficiently, the people themselves adding the energy to speed and control their passage. Walking the line of Her Majesty's Edict, are we? This must be very important, Order Sky Child Alon, great maker of the Cognati, martyr of the great storm of scales, and master of the hidden reliquary. I turned my gaze from the window to the speaker. Wearing only simple dark robes, the Arbiter of the Gods looked at me with a very serious gaze. Your Honor, the Edict, as written, only prohibits my returning to the Home Realm itself, and as I am sure you are no d- His raised hand brought my explanation to a halt. Easy, Ordis. This is one of the few places in the realms that can actually contain your more dangerous attributes. You're lacking humor, quite in particular. A wide smile split his face. So what brings you to me today? I looked around the transport meaningfully. This needed to be private, to which only a raised eyebrow met my unasked question. Of course it was a foolish question. Just another way for me to delay what I was about to have to do. I pulled an info tome from my robe and slid it, face down, towards him. Just had to let go of a piece from my personal gallery. Thought you might be familiar with the exhibit in question. The Arbiter was famed for his ability to be unreadable. But the slightest widening of his crystalline eyes as he took and looked at the tome revealed what I already knew about his stake in this particular piece. Familiar? You're damned right I'm familiar with this exhibit. After all was done, did they take that th th thing off the board? And the loss of personnel it took me to do it? And now, you just let it go? Without even consulting me? His glare would have been withering if it were not for the fact I hadn't actually delivered the bad news yet. It was a sanctioned release by DX level authority. I tried my best to deliver this as evenly as possible. His reaction was as immediate as it was subtle. To think about most wouldn't even perceive it, maybe on a gut level. How does one react when another being literally stops moving? down to the atom for just half a breath. The X. And who did he send? No anger, just the directness of one trying to get things done, as he was well famed for. I need to answer, of course, it was old in the tone, but I timed my answer for his arrival to the image of the man himself. The agent. Another breath of unnatural stillness. Oh. His stiff edge softened, and his eyes betrayed a mind in a race to put together what was going on. That both massively complicates and eases things. I am to assume that I am the first one you came to with this matter? I thought of going to Varia, but felt this might need to stay in-house. Good call. Thank you. Now, I know you will try to get away and get back to your little box in a hurry, but I insist that you stop by the house and see Naomi.
then join us for a meal. There really wasn't a way for me to decline. Naomi, along with being his loyal wife, was the former right hand of the Empress herself. To offend by refusal could earn me a private invitation to explain my lack of decorum to Her Majesty personally. Not something to be taken lightly. So I nodded my acceptance. And just then the transport came to a stop. The doors opened, revealing that we had arrived in Leeds Retreat. Being the residential area for the officials and diplomats that worked here, it would only be a few minutes for me to walk to his house. The sounds of the door closing behind me and the transport leaving, still carrying the Arbiter, told me it would be a bit longer for him, even if he ended up beating me to his front door. I wondered where he would go first, and began to slowly walk to the waiting meal. As the doors closed and the transport carried me away, Leaving orders to make his way to my house, I consider my next action. Things were afoot, and someone was meddling in affairs they should not. I cast my mind to locate the agent. He is where I would have to start. Locating him, I stood and walked into the closed doors of the moving transport, shifting myself to outside his home with but a thought. The smell of this place always made me smile, as the waterfall falling into the lake before me carried the scent of all the celestial energies mingled in its waters. It was by those properties, as well as dozens of other layers of protection, that made me forced to appear outside, instead of inside and face to face with the resident of this mountain abode. Before I could give it any more thought, a land bridge broke the surface of the lake, and the waterfall parted, allowing me to step past its deceptively disguised destructive power, and in to the mountain base. I chose to make the several hundred foot crossing in a single stride, not wanting to extend things any longer than necessary. As soon as the waterfall closed behind me, I could hear the man I came to see greeting me from the main hall. Wondered how long it would take you, your honor. Have a seat and share a drink with me. He was sitting at a table with the exhibit he so recently obtained from its place of safekeeping behind him and under a sheet. I made no effort to hide my displeasure. In response, he poked a thumb towards the covered item. You know... I recognize the markings on this thing. Trying to hide something, your honor. I nearly let his barb get to me, and then remembered there were things afoot, and far better ways to get what I came for. But I couldn't hide my annoyance in my response. You are interfering in affairs you have no business in, Dragoal. Return that to me, and that will be the end of things. The look on his face darkened, a rare thing. It almost made me reconsider my words. You are Arbiter of the Gods. I am a mortal, and not within your preview or authority. Take care with your threats, Criston. You are wrong in three ways. One, you are in interfering with the internal affairs of a sovereign nation, a full foundational member of the councils no less. Two, you have subverted and misused hunter authority to do such. And three, you are a damn Karayan and among my vast array of duties is the protection and governance of the touched. So what is it that the Teltekians say? Three strikes and you're out? I began to walk slowly towards him. He just seemed utterly unfazed, throwing an info tome at me with a flick of his metal wrist. By instinct, I caught it and then I looked at it. It contained some design spec suggestions and requirements for a build. Expensive, complex, 
very difficult to do work, and requiring some of the most rare materials. Wait, this was even more of an affront. What is this? You stick your tail in my personal affairs, and when the reckoning so rightly comes for it, you expect me to build you this? You've lost your mind, right? I mean, you've gone crazy. Do you have any idea how much the- His glare stopped me in my tracks with its utter disinterest in my protest. If you don't think I'm good for it, and can't see past your own affairs to the larger picture, I would remind you to remember who backs me. Mortal God. That caused me to stop and look more fully at the design and consider all that I knew about the situation. A smile crossed my face as various fragments of information began to form a larger, if still incomplete, picture of my mind. Of course, this was how they did things in such cases. He'd done his homework, but he had a flaw in his plan. One that would derail his efforts before they'd even began, and that gave me an angle to play. So I took it. So, you're going to be recruiting? It is being prepared for... Why? He knew I was up to something. That wry smile on his face. And this is the well you are choosing to draw from. I made it clear I knew some he did not. He took a long moment before he decided to answer. One of them. What are you getting at? One of them. That meant this was bigger than I was hoping. He gave me that bit of information as a gesture. So I guess I should have played nice. You got a good setup so far. I pulled a data stone from a pouch on my belt. But you're using the wrong incentive. Here, this should help you out. I tossed it to him with the same motion he'd used with the infotome. He caught it and plugged it into the data port on his arm without a word. And after a few moments he looked at me with a serious, exasperated face. And how in the realms am I to manage a trick like that? Those don't exist. Not my issue, Karayan. I'll be off. It seems I have my own work to do. Waving the tome, I turned and made for the exit and began forming the thoughts that would take me back to my house, just in time to answer the door for orders. So, how long until you need this? Six months. Year would be best. Oh. No pressure then, just a task that should take at least a decade and a twentieth of the time. Who is being downright reasonable today? You best know what you're doing. You have no concept of what that thing can do if it should go bad. I locked it away for a reason, and I will not hesitate to inform management post haste should your endeavor even hint at becoming a threat to the realms. And should it become a threat, your backer will answer for it. And I will see them take your touch for this, at the very least. My last line left the air still, and his soft flat response told me the stakes were much higher than I wanted to have considered. I'd expect nothing less, Lord Arbiter. We all carry out our duties. As we must. Acceptance of my threat in such a plain way. Not a comforting sign. The less buster and pretense, more dire the stakes. And with that, I left. Intent on figuring out what game was being played. And why the gods were being left. As the night drew on into the witching hour, I stood to leave, dropping a small bag of coins to cover the cost of me and Lefty's reunion. To his credit, Lefty didn't try to stop me for once, 
simply adding his own bag of coins to it. Don't get up. You can set off in the morning. I have to get a move on, however. Where to next? I need to get somewhere very specific. I stopped thinking for a moment. Any clue where Percival is? His experience would make this an entirely easier affair. Lefty looked at me with a somber gaze. Drunk ya. He let the implication hang. You sure you need to talk to him right now? Could you give him, say, a week, maybe three? For my part, I didn't understand the meaning for his presence there. However, the consequence of him being there was very clear. He was most likely going to be very drunk. Now, normal people can be quite dangerous when drunk. Reduced sense of feeling, extra flexibility, less limits on exertion. Hell, the inability to know when your ass has been beaten all make a normal person a handful of drunk, and they're combative. Now, I was about to have to see what that particular set of circumstances resulted in when applied to a millennia-old, diamond-ranked, void-variant Criston who was also a grandmaster of the Criterion Gun Dance. <sighs> this looked to be at least entertaining, if a little bit lethal. Perfect. Yes, tonight in fact. Any idea when he got there? Or how deep in the bottle he's gotten? Arrived last night. Assets on site are keeping us off court and around whichever bar he's in. I raised an eyebrow. Trying to control people and drunk is like ha trying to herd elven cats after they've gotten into the wine. <sighs> he seemed to follow my thought. Easy enough to entice most people to go into one bar over the other with the right criers. Now, that would be true. As long as the drink flowed, one bar was much like the other. But something else was obvious, and I couldn't go without speaking to it. Wait, you have a protocol for this. To include on-site assets? His face was sorrowful, and then a small glint of his normally mischievous nature showed out. Yes, and it's Hunter's affairs. He waved off the follow-up. Go, and you'll most likely learn why. Fear not for the collateral. It's drunk here after all. You'll know what can't be touched. Even if you don't now, I'm sure you'll be able to tell. You're not a fool after all. His smile widened before becoming very serious again. You'll have to wear him out. He only drinks the hardest of the shit when he goes there. Word is he has a custom vintage crafted only for himself in order to be able to get so drunk in the first place. Knowing Chris Licker, he'll be overcharged and angry as well. All of that made an unfortunate amount of sense. I nodded and made to leave. Best to get this over with. I'll see you at the waypoint, Lefty. Be careful. One missing for the world tag. Have fun! Fun? Well... I didn't want to give the wrong impression to Lefty, but not a thing he said did anything but make me look forward to this next little bit of work. I hadn't had a proper scrap in way too long. And a bar fight with a drunken assassin of near peerless ability. Yeah, I should have outcounted the proper scrap. I chose to grace myself to the northern end of town and drew in a deep breath. Taking a moment to sift through the smells while doing the same to the vast chorus of songs and other noises in the air. Roasts and stews. With a tone of reverie and joyous camaraderie with the general feel of the town so far this night. With only one particular exception. Deep in the dark west side of town. I walked towards the bar in question. And as I closed in on it I heard the music that was coming from within stop with a sick crushing sound. A moment later, 
a dwarf came bursting through the front wall of the establishment, thrown with enough force to create a hole twice the size of the man being thrown. I moved and placed myself in the path of the tumbling man, catching him while being shifted back by the force of the throw. He looked up at me drunkenly, holding the two halves of a Criterion songboard. As I set him down, I repaired his instrument and sent him in the direction of another bar. Bleh, thanks. That's about all he could manage. Seems someone doesn't like the daughter's shovel shanties. He mumbled as he began to softly strike up one of the said shanties while wandering to the bar I had just pointed him at. I turned and looked at the hole the dwarf's body had made. A few moments and saw Percival, just as he saw me. I could see his gaze take a moment to recognize me, his crystal eyes seeming to have their own sloshing liquids within them. A moment of confusion on his face and I began to relax, as it seemed he was not in a fighting mood, and I stepped forward to go greet him. That was a poor choice and I felt my jaw rocked back as the energy blast hit me in the face, its void energies flowing across and melting away the matter of my head and skull on a base molecular level. Starting in the deep end, are we? Is all I managed to say before the blast took my head in the flow of dark and tropic forces. I responded by flicking my wrist, throwing one of my weights in the thin wire cord that kept it attached and part of me and controllable. I could feel as it arced through the hole and found my target, striking his left hand with the force of a charging were rhino. It sent his pistol flying to and embedding itself deep into the wall. His retort was to snap off half a dozen shots with his right hand, and I felt them all hit at once at major points, shoulders, hips, base of my wings, and I chose right then to move things on a bit. This time. Instead of rending the flesh and matter, the blast found no purchase on me and instead flowed and rolled over my body, eventually dissipating in a soft, whining crackle, just as my head and face finished regenerating. Damn feather brains! You can't even fucking die right! His voice was thick with venom and rage. I went to disarm his other hand, tossing a weighted wire his way, followed up by two more for good measure. Knowing what was coming, he chose just to toss the pistol at me like one might a hatchet before fading into a dark mist. Let's see if I can teach a dumb bird a new trick. Coalescing and striking out by seizing the gun mere feet from my face and firing should have been a winning move for him, and a damn stylish one at that if it were not for the gut kick he formed into receiving. That sent him flying into the wall that I had just embedded his gun in, allowing him to grab it and once again fire at me with bows, this time from dozens of different angles. To an outsider, it would seem as if he fired one or two shots before bursting into a, a misty cloud, only to reform and repeat this from another angle. In truth, he was firing dozens of voice blasts with each attack. I dodged the majority of them and used my wires to parry and deflect the bulk of the rest of them, all while striking out myself and making sure to herd him into a smaller and smaller area. My wires were rolled around us as I would catch a weight as it was in flight and redirect it with renewed force at a new target as I began to have to deflect kicks and punches from him as well. Finally. He was starting to get mildly serious, and more than one strike managed to get past my defenses and land beyond a glancing blow. For my part, I was giving as good as I got, but there was a problem we both faced. Without one of us escalating this far beyond a drunken brawl, there was no way for either of us to beat the other into submission. We both just recovered far too quickly from the relatively minimal damage we were doing to each other. After 15 minutes and 8 bars in ruin, with their core still intact, I made my move to end this before that true escalation occurred, and this caught the attention of the wrong people. 
I stopped. With a mighty exertion, I pulled all my wires in tightly as he unleashed a furious set of blows into my face, chest, and side, kicking and blasting at point-blank range as he did so. So pulled, they formed a sealed dome around us and closed him into hand-to-hand -hand range, with no space to mist out through or other path of escape. He looked around as the coil seized him by the limbs and held him still, beginning to scream at me once his situation became clear to him, and he unleashed round after arcing rebounding blast into me, screaming as the guns were eventually taken as well by my cords out of his hands, and staring with drunken fury as my flesh and wire remade itself after each and every shot that landed with the force of a cannon and left not even a scuff on the coils of the wire that wrapped my body. You cheating twit, you're low gone feather-headed fuck just like your father. You can't even stop a drunken Kriston properly. You have no idea what it's like to be me. With that, he turned into mist once more. I knew he was going to reform behind me, intent on taking my wings off, no doubt if nothing but to inflict grievous harm, just to ease the pain he was feeling himself. Whatever brought him here was a deep and old pain. I hadn't thought him capable of it, in fact. He was some model super assassin, or had been every other time I had met him. I sighed, and as his misty hands started to coalesce to grab the base of my wings, I and all my wires just vanished. His guns fell. The roof of the building we were in fell. Hell, even Percival fell for a few inches as the roof broke over and around him. He looked from side to side slowly, confused as the sound of the collapsing building died down. And I thought, saw the beginning of regret for his choice of words form on his sobering face. And I couldn't have that. So I appeared above him and launched into a volley of punches and kicks. His training and reactions took over as I knew they would, and regret a forgotten matter as he tried to keep up with my assault. He had always been good, one of the very best that the younger races had ever had to offer. But he was still drunk, and I had been a master of the true fist before his people had even been invented. Well, he had many of his own advantages that might matter more in a true fight. As I struck out with my wings and caught his skull between them with enough force to powder bone and liquefy flesh, he was given a stark reminder of what exactly he was facing. And he fell to the ground, stumbled back, and just sat on the rubble. His star metal skull was ringing with the force cascading through it. He looked at me as he half-heartedly rummaged around in the debris. Really? Are you kidding me? Damn you feather brain, I'm going to hear this ringing for a week. Still, I guess it's better than that wench you show. Ah, here it is. Plunged his hand into the debris around him and drew out a metal bottle. The very one he had started this whole affair holding. Funny that. Opening it and finding it still had some left, he made a great show of slowly draining it and bowed as he tossed to the bottle into the pile behind him. Unseen applause sounded with a soft chuckle mingled within it. Percival didn't seem to notice the oddness of it as he looked and addressed me coherently for the first time since my arrival. So it brings you to darken my night, oh unkillable Analar master of bullshit. I need your help with the job. I could see he was still on the edge between being interested and enraged at my intrusion. I needed him to focus. I needed his skill. So, I whispered the next bit low. So low that only his enhanced hearing would pick it up at this distance. I need to get inside the Omnimind chamber and do it unseen with no trace left behind. Any thought of resuming the fight vanished with a steel-edged look of contemplation and consideration. A long pause hung in the air before he responded. 
that's insane. But doable. Maybe. And you want it off the books, I assume. Of course. Why else would I have come to you? You're a pain in the skull, Tag. But damn it, I'm in. Let's get somewhere to talk about numbers and details. Big numbers. He stood with his guns back in their holsters and made to follow me as I turned and began to walk away. In the morning, they'd find quite the haul of coins in the debris of the various bars. After all, it was the least I could do for not being able to keep the destruction down to a single bar. And it had been a most satisfying scrap, if a bit on the short side. Most satisfying indeed. As we walked into the capital of Criterion, Chrishold, I found it amusing that even after all that happened to this place, I could still see this city's and the greater nation's analar roots. A bit of architecture here, a line and curve of the roads there, minor thing. But to the practiced or ancient eye, the genesis of this land was clear. It's a wonder, even to you, isn't it? Percival spoke as we walked along the road. This was not a place that existed in the old age, yet it clearly finds its origins there. So, it is curious. I haven't spent the time to delve too deeply into its history. There has been so very much to catch up on. So many new things. An unstated question went unasked by my companion, thankfully. There is both a lot to learn and not much at all. They've kept it themselves for the most part, but have had a mostly unseen yet undeniable effect on the history of the realms. And, except for a couple of large incidents, they've managed to keep themselves out of the limelight. Not bad for what was originally intended as a planetary conquest force. He was waiting for my reaction, and smiled as I turned, looking in shock. Conquest? How could that be? It was Kirtha Skychild, one of the heroes of the Vanquishers that founded all of this, right? He nodded, the smile on his face widening. Ha! How, by her throne, does that happen? I mean, why would he want to? He's never struck me as a type. He's a loyal man. He's a soldier, a bis... He's definitely not a madman. It didn't make sense. It was just that. A madman. At least he was at the time. He stopped abruptly, smiling wide. Ha! Ah! It is still here and open. I followed his gaze to an old tavern. A wonderful place where we can grab a drink and a meal. I'll explain a bit more as we eat. Thirsty work, you know. Smiling at my growing confusion, Percival led the way, chuckling as we walked towards the tavern. By the 9 and 4, welcome once more to the library. In today's entry, we'll be learning a bit more about the history of the nation of the Christons. That being Criterion. Unlike most of our entries, this accounting will come foremost with our tale, with the occasional explanation or clarification on my behalf. So, I do hope you enjoy this brief history of Criterion. We entered the tavern and I saw Percival wave to the barkeep in an odd manner. Some sort of sign, obviously. And the barkeep just nodded towards the door in the back, to which Percival made his way, calling for his stash and large portions of the stew and roast that filled the air of this rustic establishment with its delightful aroma to be brought to us past the door indicated and down the lift that it had concealed, we found ourselves in a nice, if cozy, private room. 
a large table, and a window for receiving food and drink from above, with the entire affair sealed quite impressively from outside observation, while not being blatant in its obfuscation of this room. Don't forget, Bird Brain, Criterion was originally an Analar battle city. Percival said as he retrieved bottles of liquor and a pot of stew, looking at the tray of the roast as I walked up and grabbed it, along with the bowls and other pieces of fine smelling meal that had been sent down, breads, and butters. A bastion city, actually. I corrected, and Percival looked at me with a mix of surprise and amusement. Ah, you would be one of the few to even know the difference, you old fart. You are correct, of course. To this day, no one quite knows where he got it. Common theories is that he found it somewhere in the many years before he took part in the Vanquisher's Rise, along with finding the reconciled and recovered. And he just kept it in his back pocket until the time was right. That would make sense, knowing Carthus. He was pragmatic, and this would have been a very ambitious project. Timing would have been key. Carthus Skychild was born many millennia before the events of the Vanquisher's Rise, and had been a Christon for the great majority of that time. So, it is indeed very likely that it was during this time that he found the city that he created Criterion from. Perhaps along with the vast amount of Criston bodies that had never been activated in the old age, that would become known as the Recovered. The Reconciled, on the other hand, were those surviving Christons that had managed to live all the years from the beginning of the Age of Vanson and the fall of the NLR to this point in history. They were recruited by Carthus to be among the first citizens of Criterion. Each of them was allowed to take a new name and a new life, free from any past they may have had, yet each bringing the wisdom of the ages that they had lived to their new home and nation. Either way, after the Vanquishers rose and beat the pants off the demon, and among the wild amount of things happening in those very chaotic centuries, Carthus chose to play his hand. He introduced Criterion to the world, and it was fairly well accepted. He had married Rinley at this point, and they'd even had kids. Verisar and Fierstein. Percival took a large bite of roast, followed by a long drink, pausing to wipe his chin. Of course, then came the judges, Krovax, the Lost Century, the outbreak of the Shadowmere conflict, that culminated in the Battle of the Link, and then there was the Enduring War. Wait, Battle of the Link? Shadowmere conflict? I mean, I, I've heard of the judges and that of Krovax, who was bested by Carthus's children, correct? And the Lost Century... How much of this place history is off of the books? I knew there had been much for me to cover in the many long ages of my absence. All those years I had been confined and away from the greater realm. But I had looked up a general history. Multiple of them, in fact. And I've never heard of half of these things. Percival looked at me intently for a few moments, considering his words. He seemed surprised and somewhat off Huh. Some of it might be above your need to know, and I don't want to get into trouble with this. He softly smiled as if that would make things any better. So, I'll just cover what's relevant to our point. Many of the things I just mentioned were the consequence of managerial misconduct. It could be said to start with the madness that Carthus himself was afflicted with. The madness I spoke of earlier. When he formed this city, he formed it as a place for Christons to be safe. And the madness took it for them to 
also be a place for them to rule from. He was building and planning for a full conquest of Jamamar to protect it. If I've got my years right from what I gather, only the home city and Evelyn would have been able to stand a chance against what stopped him. As will be explained in a future entry, after the reign of Vanson and soon after this particular point in realm's history, the founding of Criterion, the secrets of Christek were still lost to the majority of the world. Other than the original machine gifts of the NLR that brought basic comfort, the knowledge of Christek, especially any of a uh, weaponized nature, was all but absent from Jamamar. Thus, a flying city full of Christek, Christons, and a military focused around such high technologies would have been nearly uncontestable for the people of the realms. What stopped him? Of all things, love. Or, more precisely, being found out by his wife, and subsequently snapped out of his madness via percussive corrective affection. What is... what is that? In short, she beat his ass. Like any good wife will do when her husband goes off the deep end and brings shame to the family. Or threatens to. He laughed as he ate more of the stew. That and having kids seemed to have brought him back to himself. But things were afoot. And the bodies he had built for his children, the Christon bodies they would be transferred into, were sabotaged, and they ended up becoming inflicted of madness of their own. You keep mentioning a madness. Where does this stem from? There are theories. There are always theories. The most prominent of them says that being of the bloodline of the goddess of madness brought madness to all of her line, but never really bought into that idea. Why? It would make sense, wouldn't it? He looked at me with a bored yet questioning gaze. Because Her Majesty is not a goddess that suffers from all forms of madness. Don't get me wrong, she has felt the touch of each form of madness that existed, subsumed herself in their embrace, and then proceeded to master, control, and contain them. She is the goddess of madness, yes. She is the goddess of mastering all madness, as is her line. So, barring blood curses, what's the other options? What do you think it is, Purse? My guess? Interference. Upper management, perhaps? Doesn't really matter now, does it? It happened. And by the end of things, Carthus had been censured. Criterion became this continent. The base city exploded and expanded out, with all the space in between being filled with the essence of Carthus as his punishment was to try and hold his beloved nation together by becoming the continent. His children and their friends, including the elven noblest Gabriella, had defeated Korvax, the Shalmir conflict which saw a twisted version of Criterion be created, but at nine times the size and numbers, and with a leader crafted to be nine times what Carthus was in all ways, had ended and the Enduring War was in full swing. Well, wait, what did you say happened? Where do you get, where do you craft a force like that? And where did the materials even come from for that? It took Carthus centuries, it had to have. Again, it's complicated, but I will say this. This force was meant to fully and singularly be geared and focused to the conquest of Criterion, its destruction, and then the same for the rest of Jamamar. However, 
This force's central control, command structure, and logistical chain was slaughtered, or otherwise neutralized during the Battle of the Link. Now, there are scores of reserve stations that were in interplanar space, all set to support the larger offensive. Without a leader, they just splinter off, create new stations, and continue in a guerrilla war fashion. They are fully programmed in all the tactics necessary and to engage this war and the strategies to attempt to do it competently. And that is what the Enduring War is? Yes. The Criterion House Advanced Division was created and tasked with the prosecution of the Enduring War. It's the longest war Jamamar will never know about. Led by the War Master Verisar himself and his personal unit, the Brutes. While Verisar Skychild and his Brutes are known as heroes in both Criterion and the Greater Realms, having made several appearances in the Grand Colosseum at Polaron for various events, they are just known as members of the Special Forces of Criterion, not as the spear tip of the House Advanced Division. In fact, to most, the only advanced division within Criterion is that of the Criterion Military Advanced Division. The House Advanced Division is not a public entity, and most of the members that serve within it merely pass themselves as members of the normal military. So, after all this land is as we see now, one thing I never understood even being here is where are all the factories the shipyards huh Purcell had that grin again I continued Criterion sells more star vessels weapons and than any other nation and yet I haven't seen a single facility a few workshops that's it I mean how do they even wage a Oh. Percival's grin became laughter as I realized the answer. You got a quick tag. Not quick enough, but quick. Yes, all those stations they have taken over the many, many millennia. Each has been converted into manufacturing and production facilities for Criterion. That is the secret behind their economic might. But, since they always seed ground if another one enters a market they are dominating, no one's ever looked into it too closely. However, most of the big shots do know about it, in some fashion or another. And since Criterion does not monopolize things, or lord over the other realms with this, everybody stays happy. The various stations and assets that are seized during this eternal war are dedicated to the production of goods of other nations and groups as well, going so far as to see entire facilities sold to those with deep enough pockets and the trust of both the Omnimind and King Skychild. So, they have a few tumultuous centuries in the beginning, as the rest of the world was having at that time. They end up with this endless war, but the endless spoils thereof. And they just decided to stay out of the limelight until... The Sky Terror Incident. Right? For the most part. They even had a regency for a few millennia. Carthus and Renly and the family backed away from direct rulership. But that was reverted under... Strong advisement. Ended up with Calson on the throne. Freon and Fierstein spawned that one. Now, to his credit, he has led very well and done right by his people. I even heard he tried to pay big and tough on the Empress once. Now oh, that? That made me chuckle. One does not try to intimidate her majesty. Even if you are one of her line and immune to the worst of her displeasures. So, when the Age of Stars began with the Sky Terror incident, 
that great force that was lost was really only a fraction of what Criterion had available. The Sky Terror incident marks the beginning of the actual Age of Stars in many historians' view. To cover in brief, the Criterion fleet was breaking from Jamamar's orbit to begin claiming the rest of the local system for the realms. They were intercepted and stopped by the appearance of another fleet, smaller yet very significant in numbers, and in direct opposition to them. The second fleet is still a mystery to all on its origins and alignment, as well as the reason for their appearance and their hostility. However, what is known is that during the first maneuvers of the action, a rift in reality was somehow created across both fleets. This rift ripped open and tore in the totality of both of these fleets very violently, before closing again as quickly as it had appeared. Neither fleet nor any personnel were ever seen or heard from again. Presumed lost to inter-reality space. Beyond the reach of even the gods. This loss of personnel crippled exploration in the initial years of the Age of Stars. As Criterion was by far the largest provider of specialists needed for this as well as the vessels that would be crewed by them. Kinda. If you don't count the House Advance Division, which was, as always, engaged in the Enduring War, around 80% of the rest of all Criterion military personnel were lost in the Sky Terror. They did have a massive stockpile of ships and other material in reserve, but almost no one left to man or use them. If it were not from the shock and the peace that occurred in the years after the incident, the first few centuries of the Age of Stars being calm and building up for what was to come, Criterion would have been destroyed. They were on the edge. Although, to be fair, it was a very well-kept secret. Most of the realms just thought the ageless Christons were in mourning and seclusion after the incident. None knew the degree that they were actually laid low by it. So how did they recover from that? I mean, the amount of everything that is represented just by so many Christons is insane. How do you come back from that kind of loss? Luck, for one. Shortly thereafter, a couple more centuries or so, the Revered were discovered. Their detention center, exactly. And... Criterion received quite the donation from the attached vaults before the whole place went up in flames after busting out the Revered. The Revered are a council of Dragon and Analar Firsts that are joined together to further the mastery of the gifts given to them and to understand the reality that they were brought into by the Nine Wings. As such cooperation was a threat to the warring factions and their goals during the early years of the Wars of Feather and Scale, and the power that they were beginning to research threatened both sides. They contained and locked away the Revere, along with several other primal things during what was known as the Great Work. The Great Work occurred between the First and Second War of Feather and Scale. Once they were rediscovered by members of the realm and freed, they soon faded from any limelight while remaining approachable with those with the will and the reason to seek them out. More on the revered will come in the future. Oh, that would have had quite the stock pile of Anis, and that will always be the bottleneck for the Christons. Without Anis for their minds and their souls, you can't make a proper Criston. This was most likely an intentional body neck, I thought, but I left it unsaid. Exactly, and if I heard right, your aunt helped out with securing that donation. I ignored the comment and the jab. My family was a complicated thing. And soon after that, my own confinement locale was found and I was similarly freed. Yeah, that sounds about right. And for history, a rough history that is, 
I about covers things up to where you join back into things. Mm, you're forgetting about the Omni Mine. Where does it fit into all this? Ah, of course. That is perhaps the greatest work of artifice Carthus ever built. It was a base component of the city and now the nation. It was formed from a mesh of all the minds that have ever given themselves a copy of their memories to the Omni Mine. But what makes it so strong is what the base of its great mind is. He got help from most of the V's. And all the years of Criterion's history since it was created, it has never acted in any way that has brought shame to the nation or the realms. It serves as a central information exchange and advisory probability planner and reference for the various leaders of the towns and villages across Criterion. It now also controls the form of the continent and its course now that Carthus was released from his censure and punishment. The Omnimind acts as a voting member at all levels of Soviet governance, most typically only as a tiebreaker in cases that it is needed. Otherwise, it acts as an advisory and mostly bureaucratic role to the various leaders and of the towns and hamlets across the lands of Criterion. So, what I am getting from all this is, even after all that loss, they are just as strong as ever as a nation, if lacking in the potential numbers they could have. They still manage to provide the realms with a large part of their starships and weapons, as well as almost the best in Christic in the realms. Percival nodded while taking a drink and going in at his stew again. With all that said, how are we supposed to get into the Omnimind Chamber? It's got to be secured with nearly every trick in the book. We aren't. You are. He made a great show of reaching into his pocket and pulling out his timepiece. Before looking at me. In 3 hours 34 minutes and 23 seconds, a series of doors, vents, and other passages will open, creating an opening all the way from the Omnimind's chamber to the castle grounds. This will be open for three hundredths of a second as the system cycles, and for three hundredths of a second more nine minutes later as it finishes its cross cycle. That's not too little time for you to do what you need to do now, is it? His face had that look again, like he was trying to goad something out of me. He wasn't going to get it though. Three hundredths of a second. Hmm. And with our tale coming to a close, I hope you've enjoyed this history of Criterion, as told by one who saw much of it with his own crystalline eyes. Before we finish, as always, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. As always, it means the world. And until you next visit the library, by the nine and four, be well. Take care of yourselves, and each other. Hmm, that should be more than enough. Pass me a bottle. You got this right. This will be thirsty work. It would be a lot closer than I was hoping for, but under the circumstances, I'd take it. The cost was far too high not to do this. As I ate my stew and I thought about all Percival had told me, I couldn't quite shake the feeling I had been missing something. Up to nine minutes in the chamber. Hmm. What should I be looking out for security-wise? Oh, nothing automatic. The Omni Mind frankly doesn't need it. And it can protect itself with any number of weapons or other systems that are in the chamber manually. Well, manually. I assume you're not going there with violence in mind, so I'll wager you just end up having a nice chat, or being expelled out with all due force and alarms raised. Yeah, there's a chance it might just choose to end you without taking the risk. 
I glanced up from my bowl of stew at that one, only to see he wasn't joking. There was no jest or mirth in his eyes. He was being completely serious. No, no, I'm not going for violence. I just need to retrieve something. Well, you best hope that the Omni Mind doesn't care that you take it. Indeed, you better hope it wants you to have it. If not, I'll have nine minutes to convince it. We all know how charming I am. I smiled warmly. He did not match my expression. You are on your own once you get in. I'll be busy with other things until you get out. Don't take the Omni Mind lightly. It's far more than powerful enough to put you down and keep you down. No matter how much of a badass you actually are. Looking over the infotome again as I made my way through the hedge maze that separated the entry of this plane of reality and the grand hall in which my uncle could be found, I took note of when and how this intruder had breached one of the most secure facilities in the realms, and once more confirmed the method and timing as well as the spoils of this breach. This intruder was fast very skilled, and was able to leave no trace, no marks as to any surface being touched, not even prints upon the floor. Only the absence of a small item had even marked the event. The egress and egress from the location had to have been a masterful use of teleportation magics or the like, as there would have only been the smallest of openings, if any, in the security that we had in place. But, no security is perfect, no vault impenetrable, and thus this intruder was able to make their way in, take their prize, and leave. All without a single clue being left. It was an impressive deed, and the findings I had been able to gather about it made it clear in their conclusion. This issue, required my uncle's expertise, and I wasn't one to delay. Exiting the maze and crossing the vast lawn between it and the hall itself with long, purpose-driven strides, I soon found myself climbing its perfect marble stairs at the same intense pace. Now, normally my uncle would not be found here. However, matters of social import required his presence here at this time. That is, if he wanted to keep my aunt pleased, that was. I still never failed to be awed with the grandeur of my matriarch's hall. It had to be one of the most beautiful places that existed within the realms. These vast, tall halls, all filled with the finest examples of architecture and artwork from across the ages of the realm and it always held some new marvel each time I visited. As I reached the large doors that led to the tea room, I slowed and came to a stop, considering my next actions. Just barging in would only serve to anger the wrong people who were on the other side of these opulent doors. However, as if in response to my own arrival, the door opened, and my uncle stepped out, who allowed the door to close behind him, cutting out the sound of laughter of his wife and the matriarch in the room behind him. My apologies, uncle, but there has been a breach. I began, and his jovial demeanor shifted ever so slightly to his serious, intense one. What was the nature of the breach? Any idea of the goal? Or the nature of the perpetrator? I handed him the info tone. That is everything I was able to gather, Uncle. Only thing missing was a fiddle box. That brought his gaze back up to me from the tone. I assume you did your due diligence in regards to that fact. Of course, Uncle. And that is what's brought me to you. Seems to have been a comm box of one of yours, one of the uh, House Advance Division. 
or at least is a former member thereof. The file does not have many details and is unclear. I swallowed hard and took a moment to consider how to broach a subject that I had been avoiding for a very long time. My uncle chose then to ease the burden of the action I was considering. Yes, and you never inquired about us or our operations, have you? Indeed, you have not, to my knowledge at least, ever made any edict or acknowledgement of us at all, which has always been very appreciated, nephew. There was a coy grin on his face as he began to walk. Come on, I know a place we can talk. I know you have questions and I'll answer what's relevant to our current issue. He waggled the info tone to emphasize where he felt the focus needed to remain. The rest? That can come later. My thanks, uncle. Mom told me that that was perhaps the only set of affairs in the entire set that I was never to interfere in without your invitation or blessing. If I valued my neck at least. A look of exasperation flickered across his face, followed by a sentimental, warm smile for just a flash. I continued. And you are of course right, uncle. There is the more important issue of the breach itself, and what our response will be. He stopped at that. Response? Sometimes I forget that, despite being a fine lord and perhaps even better than I for the duties of state and rulership, you are not the master of clandine mischievousness that your mother is. Praise be her throne for that. He laughed for a moment before looking at me seriously. We will not be responding. I, on the other hand, may. As we stepped outside and onto a large platform, to which his ship had been moored, he asked me a question. Now, how much do you know about the Shadow Mirror War? Uncle refilled my glass from a crystalline decanter, smiling as I tried to formulate the response to what he had just said, and sat back just as I was able to find the words. He did what? Was all I could say. After hearing Uncle break down the broader details of the war and his actions within, and now listening as he described his attempts to replace one of his men that had passed in a rather vicious and terrible battle in rather great detail. My uncle was nothing if not exacting in his requirements and had described the process of going through every single record of every person in the house advanced division, attempting to find the perfect candidate, finding him, and bringing him aboard the very ship we were sitting in now, the Day Star to offer him the promotion. It would have been the greatest of honors, something that was the dream of everybody in the advanced division. The man's reaction to my uncle's offer was, well... My uncle had a thin grin on his face as I was trying to make sense of what he had just told me. You heard me. He turned me down threatened me and then informed me that as soon as he got back to his unit station he'd be sending his resignation directly to the Omni Mine. He also made it clear that he had never intended to catch my attention, then or ever again. To be fair, he was nothing if not good to his word. I haven't heard a peep about him since that day. My uncle had repeated what he said, and yet it was just as nonsensical as illogical to me before. My uncle's look, however, was one I had known very well. There was an answer here, but to what question? What he had said had brought up so many. First of all, who says no to Uncle Verisar? Secondly, secondly, who in the realms dares to threaten Uncle Verisa? Well, okay, okay. Maybe my mom and 
maybe the matriarch? But besides it, let... Lastly, who would choose to res... Wait a second. I looked at my uncle with a... Understanding gaze. Uncle, was that resignation in any way sent in a fiddle box? A wide smile was my only reply. <laughs>